Uh, Kathy Bullock is an emeritus professor. She just retired July 1st and was the uh, on faculty since 2001 and also was the interim head for the Department of Journalism and Communication. She taught introduction to mass communications and mass media ethics while also advising the student run Aggie Blueprint magazine and conducted research on media coverage of a sexual assault and intimate partner violence. Dr. Sylvia Reed is the Associate Dean in the School of Teacher Education and currently, excuse me, serves as the Associate Dean for the Educator Preparation for the College of Human Education and Human Services, where she focuses on evaluation and improvement of USU's teacher preparation programs. Dr. Reed has been with us at Utah State since 2003 and was promoted to associate professor in 2009 and promotion with an emphasis in teaching in 2018. Dr. Maria Luisa Spicer Escalante is a professor of linguistics and Spanish at USU and has received several, not one, Fulbright grants and the most recent in Mexico as a US Scholars Global Teacher of English in Foreign Language. She has prepared language teachers in several countries such as Mexico, China, Brazil, and the US. Her research interests are related to the pedagogical aspects of second bilingual and dual language education in areas where she has published several articles. I'd love for you all to enjoy them. I know um, Sylvia quite well and Maria through ETE, and I'm getting to know Dr. Bullock with all of her wonderful um, information. And again, type your questions in the chat box. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marilyn, for the introduction. Yes, we are all full professors or what some people call fool professors. <laughs> Um, I want to just get us started off by asking all of you to find at the bottom of your Zoom screen the reaction button. So there's a reaction button down here and you can give a thumbs up or you can clap. So I'm going to ask you a question in a second. And when you, when your group, the group you identify with, when I say that group, if you could give a thumbs up, this will give us a chance to figure out who you are and what group you represent. So. If you are on the tenure track or are already tenured uh, professor at Utah State University, if you could, uh, or, or anywhere else, if you could give us a thumbs up. All right. And we got two screens full. All right. Okay. Good. If you are a clinical or professor of professional practice, if you're in that track, if you could give us a thumbs up. Right. I was going to do a poll for this, but the poll isn't working. Okay. All right. And then um, if you are a instructor or lecturer, if you could give us a thumbs up. Okay. We have a really nice distribution. And if you were a graduate teaching assistant, give us a thumbs up. All right. Graduate teaching assistants, good. And then we also might have some K-12 teachers here from Utah, if we have any K-12 teachers here. Public schools. All right, oh, well, it looks like we have two or three of those. And then there might be some of you who don't fit into any of these categories, like, Britt is a librarian, but she's tenured, so she was in our first category. All right, that gives us a sense of who, who you all are. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen, and we'll get going. So we already introduced ourselves, we'll move right on. Uh, we do want you to know about this link. It's also in the description for this session, this same link. It is a link to, uh, a book that we have put together. Uh, Kathy and Maria are the editors of that book and it is a book of por teaching portfolios, teaching documentation from folks here at Utah State University. So that's open source in digital commons. And after you hear this session, you may want to go to that link and browse through some of the successful examples of teaching documentation that have been used here at USU. 
So I already asked us who's here today, and I just want you to know that we are going to leave time for Q&A at the end. Um, my part of this presentation is to just to talk to you about why you might want to document your teaching. This is why I asked who you are. So if you are in any of the ranks here at USU where you can be promoted, you can be promoted in the lecturer ranks, the uh, clinical professional practice ranks, and of course in the, in the regular assistant associate full professor ranks, um, you must document your teaching, even if your role statement is one that is, has the majority percentage in research. And the university expects you, as part of that documentation, to provide more than just your IDEA scores. They expect you to provide documentation of your work towards effectiveness or excellence in teaching in terms of things like uh, representative syllabi, um, modifications you've made to courses, curriculum innovations, teaching innovations that you've tried, uh, your responses to peer observations. There are a myriad of things that could go into your teaching. And so if you're part of that process, you're going to need to do that. If you are not eligible for those kinds of promotion, that doesn't mean you don't want to do this. You still probably want to document your teaching. You may not have to do it in quite the same uh, formalized way. But every semester that you teach, I'm sure most of you keep notes, you update your syllabus, you, you study your IDEA scores or whatever kind of feedback you get on your teaching. You have people come and observe you. And you probably are keeping some kind of a running tab on the changes that you're making. And you will find that that process um, and the process of creating a, your documentation or, or just a teaching portfolio will make you a better teacher. It will, you will um, be able to remember why you made changes, uh, why, whether they worked to the extent to which they worked. It may even become a project that you want to research and do some scholarship of teaching and learning about. Um, the other reason is what I've just been talking about. You just become a more effective teacher as you regularly write about and reflect on how you teach. Uh, other pieces that you may be wanting to write about and reflect on is how you are assessing student learning. Are you using quizzes and tests or essays or a combination or some sort of performance assessment and how is that assessment working for you? And Finally, how you have impacted student learning. This is a, especially if you're doing this for documentation for promotion purposes, the um, university is expecting you to be able to make a strong argument for how you have impacted student learning. So it might not be unique to you. you I mean, that is to say, you might not have invented something, but it might be something you are doing for the first time yourself and you're and you're measuring the impact that it's had on student learning. So be thinking about how you might want to do that. And I am going to now turn the time over to Dr. Bullock, who is going to talk about how to get started with your documentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. As Sylvia just said, documenting our teaching um, can be helpful, whether our goal is um, improving our teaching or some aspect of it, or whether our goal is uh, preparing for tenure and promotion. So how do we go about getting started with this? I'm going to offer you kind of a general outline, and then I'll turn you over to Maria Luisa for more specifics on drafting a teaching narrative. So the teaching documentation model that we're talking about today was developed by Dr. Peter Selden. It's discussed in his book, The Teaching Portfolio, and it forms the basis for the teaching documentation workshop that the provost's office sponsors in May. Now, just for the record, the provost's office and Utah State University do not require faculty to use the Selden model or any other particular model for documenting teaching excellence. But um, we found the Selden model to be very practical. It has a good track record here and elsewhere uh, of helping faculty to reflect on, think about their teaching, and document the impact of their teaching. 
And it works well for uh, faculty and other kinds of instructors um, from a variety of ranks, from a variety of fields, and with a variety of different goals. So under this model, you draft a narrative of 12 to 13 double-spaced pages discussing your teaching and the impact of your teaching. You tell your own unique story of what you do, how you do it, why you do it, and how you know you're effective with your teaching. And then you put materials supporting the points you make in your narrative in a set of, of um, appendices. Now with this approach, I think there are at least three big things to, to think about at the beginning. First, you're being asked to be selective, to synthesize. Think about it, 12 to 13 double space pages, that's not that much space, right? Your narrative isn't really a scrapbook where you throw everything in. It should be a carefully considered, concise statement that tells your story of your teaching. Second thing, your documentation should focus on the impact of your teaching and on student learning. And finally, you provide evidence to back up any claim you make in your narrative. Now this can sound kind of daunting, um, but I think that it can help, there we go, it can help um, as we get started with this to think about and think in terms of three chunks of information. First, material from oneself, material from others, and finally, products of good teaching um, and evidence of student learning. So let's take each of these in turn. Pulling together information from you, from yourself, is a great place to start because it's relatively easy. A lot of this stuff tends to be material that you already have on hand. For example, your teaching narrative is going to need to tell readers about your teaching responsibilities. What courses do you teach? What are the course titles? What are the course numbers? How often do you teach these courses? What's your typical enrollment? What's the role of the course within your program or within your institution? Required, elective, that kind of stuff. So this information sort of sets the scene. It fills readers in on the basics of your role as a teacher. Material from yourself um, also could include a statement of your teaching philosophy. What do you believe about the roles of student and teacher? Why do you teach? What do you consider effective teaching? Material from yourself can also include representative syllabi, course projects, um, assignment materials um, that help maybe show your philosophy in action or that make points about your methods and strategies that you use with your teaching. So maybe you provide a few sentences about your syllabi and assignments telling you know what this is telling about your teaching and then you put the documents in an appendix. Material from yourself also includes steps you've taken to evaluate, reflect on your teaching, um, and improve your teaching. The fact that you're participating in this conference um, is an example of a step that you're taking to encourage you to think about and presumably improve your teaching. Um, maybe changes that you've made based on uh, course evaluations or changes you've made based on students' comments in the Zoom chat function, those would fall in this category too. Material from yourself can also include a discussion of ways you've mentored students, maybe working with a student on a, a special project or ways that you've served as a formal or informal advisor for students. So all of this falls under material from oneself. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of the kind of material you might pull together. As a general kind of rule of thumb, we figure material from oneself will probably take up three to five pages of say an eight to 12 page narrative. Now the next chunk of material um, is material from others. This can include statements from colleagues who've observed you in the classroom or uh, who've reviewed your syllabi and your other teaching materials. So you get a letter from the colleague that can go in an appendix and then maybe you do a short discussion of what you took away from this and how it applied to your teaching. Material from others also includes student course and teaching evaluation data. This is a big one. It includes the numbers as well as the student responses to those open-ended questions. 
And you're going to want to provide some kind of a summary of the numbers in a table or a graph or a pie chart of some kind. You're going to want to summarize what those mean and show how you're responding to them. Material from others can also include invitations you've received to present papers at conferences, um, invitations to review syllabi and course materials for uh, colleagues, maybe at other institutions, um, teaching awards or other honors you've won for your teaching. So all of these examples fall under that category, material from others. And we figure this is probably going to take up maybe three to four pages of an eight to 12 page um, narrative. The final chunk of teaching documentation is products of good teaching. And I think this is the most challenging uh, piece because this is where you assess what and how your students have learned. There are a lot of ways to document student learning, but they often take some, some forethought, they take some, some planning. For example, products of student learning might include student scores uh, before and after a course. So this can be a kind of a pre-post comparison. So you get a picture of how the class as a whole did. Maybe successive drafts or examples of, of student essays or creative work, field, uh, field work reports, that kind of stuff. That can be used as illustrations of individual student learning. Feedback from alumni can help document student learning. Alumni statements, particularly an unsolicited one about the quality of your instruction, um, applicability of the material, what they learn from you, um, that can all show impact, as can former students' uh, success in graduate programs or jobs in the field. Graduate or undergraduate student publications, conference presentations um, on course related work, along with the description of your role as mentor, can be used as examples of student success and student learning. And finally, just graded student essays or other work along with your comments. Those can be used to track student learning um, and can be very powerful, particularly if you can show how your, your comments help students improve. So these are all examples of products of good teaching. This material is probably going to take something like two to three pages of an eight to 12 page narrative. So some of the material with the, with the bulky things in the appendix with the bulky <laughs> things right with the bulky stuff in the appendix. So some of the material from each of these chunks material from oneself material from others products of good teaching. Some is going to go in your narrative where you're telling the story of your teaching and some is going to go in that set of appendices at the end to support the points you make in your narrative. I'm going to turn you over now to Maria Luisa Spicer Escalante to talk more about drafting a teaching narrative. Just a second, uh, Kathy, before you leave. Sure. There's a question in the question box. It says, Kathy, what is the name of that model, please? Okay, it was developed by Peter Selden. Um, he, he, Selden, Miller, and Selden. And I have the reference. Yeah, yeah we have it at the very end of the slides, yeah, which we can... Also here. Okay, <laughs> so can you, is that showing up? There's the book. And it's in our slides. Um, and we also have it in a slide a little bit later in the presentation. It's called in the Teaching Portfolio, and um, it outlines the whole model and gives even more examples than you're going to get from us today. I have one more question. Sure. Uh, do the eight to 12 pages include the appendices? No, no, no. Okay. that is just your narrative and that's double space. The appendices are in addition to that. Good? Wonderful, hello everybody. I see among the um, uh, attendees or participants, some uh, people who have been part of the teaching portfolio uh workshop so if you have questions they can they can let us know what they think so as kathy said it's a little bit daunting just to think of all these materials from oneself materials from others material from others and products of good teaching so all that translate into um let me see it doesn't go through click with the on the arrow right here. Oh, okay. Hold on. So all these three parts translate into the teaching documentation narrative. So not everybody follows the same the same breakdown, but you will see that uh, some of the things that we 
that all portfolios have is teaching responsibility, teaching philosophy, teaching methods and strategy, uh, course material and student assessment tools. This is the narrative. Teaching recognitions and uh, evidence of a student learning. And yeah, and that's it. So as we promised in the abstract that we will share with you some of the lessons that we have learned by doing this, Kathy and, and, and Sylvia have been mentors for more years than I have, but I think that we have been uh, eight years, it's about eight years or something like that. So some of the lessons that we have learned is um, the, best, the big task when you do your portfolio, when you compile your portfolio, is that your teaching philosophy needs to talk or be connected to your methods, your strategies, and your assessment. That is one of the of the biggest tasks, and uh, that we that we have. So you have a beautiful teaching uh, teaching philosophy that doesn't correspond, doesn't talk to uh, the methods or the strategies or the assessment. So keeping that in mind will make your narrative stronger. So these are the resources that we were mentioning. This is the teaching portfolio. This is the book that we all use. We were all uh, prepared by Peter Selding. And we came last year, Kathy and I edited, um, put together a USU teaching documentation, a series, a series of uh, dossiers from the mentoring program. And you have the, the link right there. It was published by the provost office who has been very uh, supportive of us in this endeavor. And you will see, this is in Digital Commons, you will see that in, in the book that we put together, we, we have uh, great stories. Uh, Professor Sylvia Reed wrote the introduction and the forward from um, Francis Gailey, the provost. And you will see that we have a series of portfolios that show the narratives and the stories, the teaching narratives, the struggles, the improvements that uh, faculty members have done in different fields. So we go from music to journalism, to agriculture, education, biology, um, and you will see. So this is for you, it's available there and your hits help us. So please go and just look around, okay? So, and I would like to emphasize the fact that already my colleagues have mentioned, but I would like to put it in, in a quote from the provost office. He says, um, right, when you put together the portfolio is the ability to clearly document and articulate the story, your own story will help help academic personnel add to their tenure and promotion preparation in a very meaningful way. This is just one example of how you can document your teaching. And uh, the teaching documentation is the opportunity to describe this journey uh, with all the efforts, large and small, of improving their program in, term, in terms of learning outcomes and student grow and success. And it comes to mind, and one example that I wanted to mention, you talking about the, what we do for in our teaching. We had an example of a music teacher who had several classes, several classes with one student. And the one student, because he, he taught voice. So portfolio gave him the opportunity to mention, to mention and describe how effective he was as a teacher. So I encourage all of you, thank you for being here with us. I encourage all of you to be part of this, of this effort. And I would like to leave you with the, the words from the provost. Uh, good luck, teach on and successfully document the most important work you all do. And people who are going to read your documentation are going to appreciate that you put this narrative in 12 pages. So 12 to 13. So if you have questions, here we are. Thank you.
questions? We can stop sharing that way we can see them. Questions? And then now we can see this, let's see. Nobody has questions. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um, somebody put in the chat box a link to the book. So if you want to find the Peter Selden book, you can click on the link that Meredith Wang shared. Thank you, Meredith. Hi, this is Michael Anna, and I'm in the English department down in Price. And I have actually been through the portfolio workshop a couple of years ago. And I'm getting ready to, I'm getting the binder kind of ready ahead of time to, to submit next year to go out for tenure, uh, for tenure and promotion. And I've been reworking my teaching philosophy statement. And I think I've reworked it so many times now that I'm like confusing myself. And I was wondering if in your experience, is it better to use a theorist in someone's, you know, in our, in the individual's field to shape a teaching philosophy, or can it come from personal experience? I looked at someone else's portfolio who said, my philosophy is the philosophy of listening. So it was really informal. Um, is there a direction that you would suggest heading or any advice about um, the teaching philosophy statement and how to shape that? You know, the truth is we've seen great examples that go either direction. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen some people who very, very carefully grounded in, you know, teaching theory and specific names and other people who do it more based on experience. So we've seen good examples both ways. Yes. And I had a person I mentored one year. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I had a person I mentored one year who said, I don't have a philosophy. That's a, that's a fully developed, you know, giant body of thinking. He said, I have, I have some principles of good teaching that I follow. And I said, great, you know, use that as your way of framing it. Personally, my bias is to look to the literature on teaching and learning um, with adult learners and to at least have this is my bias though, so like I'm not the provost. Um, <laughs> to ground it in at least one teaching and learning piece of research, especially if it's an evidence-based teacher piece of research. And I know at the university, I'm looking at my bookshelf, sorry. This is the nice thing about being in your own office. Um, no, I took it home. Uh, I know for the past few years, the University has used for new professors a book about, I think, Making Learning Happen. I think that's the title. And, you know, looking at especially things that we have used here at USU and using those as touchstones, because for one thing, I think that when we look outside of our own belief system, we enrich our practice. Um, so I, I would argue that it is good to look to theory research um, mm -hmm. when we're building that teaching philosophy. For, for one thing, it makes us grow. Yeah. And oh, oh the, one of the, you know, uh, when, whenever we have the mentoring program in May, we get together, all of us, and to talk about what the difficulties were. Every day, every day of the workshop, we get together as mentors and mentees in, in mentors in training, right? So um, we have a series of questions to help you with the teaching philosophy. If you reach out to me, we have that. And Sylvia, years ago, Sylvia um, had a teaching philosophy article and the importance of teaching philosophy available. I don't know if when you did the portfolio workshop, uh, if you had access to that, if you didn't send me a, send us an email and we will, we will forward them to, to you to see if that helps. 
Um, there is a question in the chat box. Before we do that, can I mm -hmm. add something? Yes, yes please I do. I want to add something. Something you said struck mm -hmm. me. Um, and so I just want to add this, sure. even though you didn't ask the question. Um, the idea of working and reworking your materials, and we all get to the point where we're sort of like almost punch drunk. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I have here? One thing that, the, that um, this whole model um, sort of calls on is working with a mentor. Um, you know, so if you can find someone, um, there are a bunch of us who've been trained as teaching documentation mentors. Um, we can provide a list for you, or we, one of us can work with you, and it's another set of eyes to read what you've done and maybe just ask some questions that can help guide you. Um, so if you want that, sometimes working with a mentor can help sort some of this out. Feel free to reach out to us if you want us to read, read, it, read, read through and give you some feedback. It's always good. Uh, when I went for full professor, Kathy, everything was ready. The, the last part that I had been perfect, right? Because I'm a mentor, the teaching portfolio, it should be perfect. Kathy tore apart my portfolio and it was nice wonderful. One. It was the best feedback I have ever received. So I encourage you to, yeah, reach out to us. Okay, so we have a good question here. Um, the person jesse says that in the book all the examples are from tenure track faculty and yes um and he asks or she asks do we have any examples for the clinical or professional practice ranks and meredith says how do we participate these are all related that's why i'm sharing them um and then um is there a formal or informal way to participate. So I'm going to let Kathy feel this because you've worked most closely with the provost office recently about who gets chosen and how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the annual um, teaching documentation workshop, um, when it started, it was specifically for tenure track faculty with teaching as their area of emphasis. And um, that's sort of continued as faculty in a certain stage of their career because they want, you know, they can't have, they don't have enough seats for absolutely everybody. And they're trying to, to make sure they're preparing people who have teaching as area of excellence and who are in, you know, what year two, year three, um, as they move toward tenure. Um, I think that, um, I think because of, you know, limited resources, that's probably the way it's going to continue. But having said that, I know in our college um, this past year, they had a luncheon session specifically for lecturers who wanted more information on how to um, prepare to go up for promotion within the lecturer ranks. So in addition to this workshop, um, if you're, if you're you know, not, if, if teaching isn't your area of excellence, if you're not the exact right year going through tenure, it doesn't mean you can't get in that workshop, but there are also other resources out there for you. And I think the principles apply across. So whether you're a lecturer, whether you're tenure track, third year, second year, first year, whatever, I think the, the principles still apply. But I do think that Utah State's now offering some other ways to get training like this, in addition to that May workshop. And in terms of an informal way to participate, um, what I would do is ask in your college or your department, who in your department has been through this and has developed it? Because then that person would be an automatic person for you to ask to see if you could have an informal mentorship. But I, I think the other thing I would urge you to do, and this is where everybody starts, is just get the Selden book or get the book from Digital Commons, just study some examples and start building it and then share it with your committee as you're meeting with your committee every year because ultimately it's your committee that's going to be giving you that feedback on your documentation for promotion whether you're in the tenure track ranks or not um i also questions? think that being part of this workshop shows us how many people are interested on on this and people who don't get the the invitation because we years ago we used to send the invitation to the heads of the department so the heads of the department will will pass this information through faculty members so i think that this uh, in the last two years this the email has been sent out to all tenure track faculty members inviting them to participate and 
is, is a wonderful way to push. If you really want to participate, push for it. Um, we also have a question here. Um, are the things that you've done while you were a graduate student included, especially in the early years? Um, that's a, a thing that I would clear with your committee mm -hmm. because certainly they form, this is my opinion, they form your trajectory, but typically they don't quote unquote count right. towards your tenure or your promotion process. Right. Nevertheless, they show that you have a trajectory. They show that you're building um, a, a body of whether it's teaching or research that you can talk about um, and show improvement over time. Uh, as research track faculty, the AAA sometimes did not collect the detailed IDEA evaluation, even though teaching is the major responsibility in my role statement. Hmm. hmm. What can be done about that? I would contact AAA and also your yeah. department person who works with them and make sure that those IDEA evaluations are getting sent out. And another way to, to back up this is to have informal evaluations in your classes. You know, especially the, the example that I mentioned to you with one student, obviously that is not going to show in the statistics. So he found, uh, this, this professor found a way to collect data about his ability. And, and something uh, very important is that the provost's office wants to see um, not everything has to be perfect so you have to show improvement it's a good it's a good way to, so if you had a, if you have a, if you face a problem feel free to talk about that and show how you have improved it is okay we are not perfect yeah the other piece of that is after a while you can't improve anymore right um, I've seen um, working with the documentation workshop, there are people out there with sky high idea scores and they're not going to keep going up. But um, these are folks who still are looking at the, like the student comments they're getting and still showing how they're responding to it. So it's not just a question of taking your idea scores and graphing them. Um, it's, you know, as Maria says, you should be showing some kind of progress. You should also be showing how you're responding to, if you get, we all get negative comments of some kind. Um, and you've got to show how you're responding to that and you know how that's impacting what you're doing. And that's actually one thing I heard from the provost's office a number of months ago. They said one thing they saw was that you know people really weren't grappling with you know how am I um, using this information I'm getting from IDEA to shape my teaching? How am I using it to improve my teaching? So as Maria said, don't be afraid to address that head on. They expect you to. Just show how you're using it to make improvements, how you're addressing it. I think one thing we'll do though, for whatever power we have, which is minuscule, is to take back to the provost's office this interest among the lecturers and the professional practice and clinical ranks and you know, let them know that, that there are folks who would like to participate and because uh, I think they need to understand that you know that there are folks out there who want this uh, want this support structure too, not just the tenure track folks. That doesn't guarantee that it will happen, but we can try. But we yeah. will try. certainly pass on the message. Yeah, and uh, I I didn't have enough time to share something that we the three of us have discovered while compiling our portfolios, our teaching portfolios. It was also a way to help us to put together a research narrative. So take that into consideration that you, you get multiple benefits by doing this. Yeah, actually Selden has another book called The Academic Portfolio. That's that very same idea. So taking this idea of, of having your teaching narrative and appendices and then applying that same idea to your research and being able to develop a cohesive statement about that and what you're doing there. Somebody had a question related to the appendices, and I don't see it anymore, but um, we, I think we answered it. Um, oh, in the appendices, should entire documents be included or samples, meaning the entire syllabus or certain parts of the syllabus? 
I think that depends on the point you want to make. Mm -hmm. um, you need to remember, if this is documentation you're using, for example, for going up for tenure and promotion, you think about that central committee and how many of these binders they're going to be reading. How much time do you think they're going to spend with any one appendix, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if putting your entire 11 page syllabus in there um, isn't really going to serve any purpose, don't. Put the piece that's really going to make the point you want to make. But if you feel you need the whole syllabus to make your point, that's fine. Um, just you want to make this um, as straightforward and easy for your readers as you can. Here's another question. What would be the first best step, best first step for a brand new faculty member to start documenting non-tenure? Mm. First step. I would say keep, keep a, a log, a journal, um, you know. And I, and I would say now, I don't know if, you're, if your classes are going to be face to face or via Zoom. This is the easiest way to document your teaching. Videotape yourself. You don't have to share with anyone. Just look at yourself. Look at how, how you move, how you address the students, how you talk. For example, in my case, I still, I still, and I'm going to watch this. I practice in front of the mirror every time I have to give a formal presentation. And even if you don't believe it, I practice today. I practice looking at you, and those are ways that I, in which I want to improve. Start getting um, some feedback from colleagues. Um, with the pandemic, it's hard to have somebody come in and watch your class, but there are ways to still get colleague feedback. You know, things are recorded and so on. So, you know, make use of that. It's because one thing you don't want to do is get up to your six and then all of a sudden have a lot of colleague observations you want those as you go so as a brand new person start collecting those now yeah and if you don't have um if you don't have colleagues who can go and observe your classes send me an email and i will send you what i have done in terms of self-assessment when i went for full i didn't have um feedback from my colleagues because i was tired of having this feedback empty feedback so I, I went and I proposed the provost office to document my teaching I, and I documented three years of my teaching with the and I gave uh, several examples of how uh, from first grade teaching in the dual language immersion from first grade to undergrad classes, graduate classes, Spanish, English, uh, everything so talking about myself and what I did as a teacher. Okay, we have two minutes and we have a question oh. here. I am a teaching focus, tenure track professor in sociology. How do I find a colleague who's teaching focus tenure track from a different department to see their expectations? From the College of Humanities, um, and Humanities can we name a name? Alan, either, either one of Alan, us. They're both in the college. Either one of us could help you. Yeah, Alan, Alan Blackstock. Alan Blackstock. Alan Blackstock. Oh, ask gosh, Maria. Yeah. Who else? Oh, oh my gosh. We can come up with some other names for you. Yeah. If you don't like those. Email, but. email them. Yes. Okay. We'll get somebody for you. Great, thank you so much for this engaging session. If you would like to continue the dialogue with our presenters, again, go back to the Mighty Networks app. Um, I note that there are several of you that would also like to network for that, that section of the lecturer track. I'm in that section too. And so I really hope that you can continue the dialogue there. Thank you so much for your presentation. Looks like we had 71 participants. That's the largest I've seen. So thank you so much for recording. If you can stop your recording and we'll end the session and I'll let you do that. So thank, thank, you. You. thank you. The next sessions are the teaching technology sessions.